Welcome back to the Media 7 Science Special from the ONG Glen Building at the University of Auckland. The term Matauranga Māori refers to the body of knowledge that was first brought to these islands by the Polynesian ancestors of present-day Māori. It is formally acknowledged on the website of the Ministry of Research, Science and Technology. But what does it mean in the practical sense to the work of science? Should it be held close or widely shared? Or is the real issue the economic value of Māori engaging with science and technology? I'm joined now by Dr. Dan Hikaroa of the Institute of Earth Science Engineering at Auckland University, uh, Victoria University astrophysicist Dr. Pauline Harris, and the Associate Dean of Māori and Pacific Development and Director of the Mira Zazi Research Centre at Auckland University, Dr. Monica Henry. Welcome to you all. <laughs> Dan, you deal in hard, measurable science. What could that have to do with spirituality? Well. On the surface of it, that, that's quite a difficult question to answer. And maybe if you sort of charted my journey back when it started, I really would have had an answer like I couldn't do any, have anything to do with it. But now in hindsight, I think at subconscious level, decisions I've made have been maybe a little bit more to do with spirituality than maybe hard science. How is that? Give me an example. So I find myself now in, um, in a research role and for that, I'm working with communities trying to realise their dreams through Earth System Science or fix problems that they face. Now, when I made those decisions to track through as a scientist, I had no idea that what I'd be doing now would be feeding back into those very communities for which I'm working with. And there are, I guess, uh, secular ways of describing exactly the things you're doing. What, what's the appeal of, of employing concepts like Māori, which, which you do in your work? When we look at simple things like a cost-benefit analysis that doesn't fit too well with what was traditional thinking, and I would say is, is even contemporary thinking in many Māori communities. And so they don't look at just the basic dollars and cents impact of, say, something like a geothermal development. But they would look more at, at a value system that values Māori, or that life force concept. And so instead of just looking at a dollars and cents balance sheet, they would look at what impact would this development or potential development have upon Modi? Sure, money is a part of that, but if they were to develop a power station that destroyed the hot springs from which all their um, basis comes from as a people, they've lived around them for many years, they would be destroying the Modi. So they have to balance out maybe extracting a little less steam to generate money, but maintaining those springs flowing. So overall, Modi is enhanced, but it's not just a dollars and cents issue. It's a potentially tricky concept once it gets into the media, though, isn't it? The moment you see Tanifa in a headline, you know which way that story's going. Exactly, and I think Tanifa is, is a really good example of how it's been misused. The way I've been explained and told about Tanifa is that they are kaitiaki, they are guardians. And so let's say there might be some Tanifa in the Waikato River from where I'm from. Now, the Tanifa are always in, when you look at them, or oftentimes in places where it's maybe a little bit dangerous to swim. And so there are certain rules or tikanga and protocol around those Tanifa. Things like don't go swimming near the Tanifa because the Tanifa will get you. Now if you actually step back a little bit from that, and if you listen to those protocols and those rules, what that's actually saying is that's a dangerous place to go and swim. So if you obey the rules, obey the tikanga, you'll be kept safe. Therefore, the Tanifa is your guardian. And I think that's a concept that's really missed in the media. Pauline, uh, no Tanifa in your work, I assume, but you are, you're an astrophysicist. Yeah. Uh, you're also involved with the Society for Maori Astronomy Research and Tradition. Yeah. Tell me about that, because it sounds fascinating. Yeah, it is really interesting. So during my science career, um, I didn't have much to do with things Maori, and it was actually quite a big gap for me. Okay? And so I was kind of thrown into the deep end, as you may say, um, to give a talk on Māori astronomy. So from that point in time, it was actually something to help fulfil that other side and other cultural and spiritual aspects for me in science. So I ended up um, creating a project um, to collate and preserve and revitalise our traditional astronomical knowledge and infuse it with um, astrophysics concepts from a modern scientific perspective. So. Now I'm chairing the Society for Māori Astronomy Research and Traditions. And, and this is an organisation for lay people as well, is it? It's not just a scientist's organisation. Yeah, no, not at all. It's mainly for our communities, you know, for us to be able to communicate 
with our communities to be able to share our knowledge and traditional astronomical knowledge in Western. Um, navigation is a big part of it as well, but also on many different levels for communication and discussions to occur from experts to school children. So having a lot of stuff to do with schools. So how do you explain what your job is? How do you explain what you do? What I do, I have um, kind of two main aspects I have. Well, three, I'm a mum. That's my main one. You know, I've got an eight year old. Yeah. Um, and she'll be the one carrying on the next generation of astrophysicists, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but um, one of my aspects is, um, is Western astrophysics, or Western, but really it's worldwide astrophysics. And I do what's called gravitational microlensing, which is searching for extrasolar planets outside of our solar system. So that's called planet hunting. Which sounds really phrase. cool. It is really cool. I would cool. like it if I was a kid and someone who was a planet <laughs> hunter came to see me. Yeah, it's, a, it's really good at parties too, so maybe <laughs> I, I'm a planet hunter. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I go to parties, but yeah. Uh, Manuka, you were one of the first people, as far as, as I can tell, who started talking about a Maori cultural dimension to science, the, the koru framework that, that, that you largely devised. How well developed have these ideas become since, since you first, first started talking about them? Hmm. Uh, well, I'm uh, a, a, a historian, is my science, and also an anthropologist, so I look at cultures as they change and how do people change over time. Um, uh, I, the idea that um, uh, it wasn't uh, when Captain when Hobson came here in 1840 and signed this treaty, he brought all this w Western science. It just struck me as peculiar because I asked myself, well, what did Maori do for the 7,000 years before they arrived? And they must have had ways of looking at the universe and the oceans and for sailing and all that kind of thing. And so that led into to that inquiry. And in fact, we now know that every culture has its own form of science. Western science is a particular branch of it. And, uh, and uh, it's been a wonderful contribution to humanity, but, uh, but we can track a history of scientific approaches, outlooks, and methods back five, 7,000 years back into the Austronesian period, back into uh, Asia. And, uh, and science is simply looking for the truth of something, I think is the way I look at it. And uh, then you work out different ways of looking for the truth, sometimes experimenting, getting it wrong, and then you learn from the mistake, or just sit down and just thinking about it at depth. And so Maori astronomy fits in nicely with the astrophysicist of today because they ask very similar questions. What the heck is going on out there? Who's out there? How did it all come together? And who keeps it all together? So that all these planets don't just crash into each other. This, and um, well, Maori ancestors have been thinking like that for centuries. So that was my own little inquiry. And then in recent times, I've had the pleasure of meeting the, I think there must be one or 200 Maori scientists now, ranging from the astrophysicists to earth scientists to anthropologists and so on and so forth. And um, uh, so there's a whole vibrant new force coming into the Maori world. And they will have, in my mind, a huge impact on the emerging Maori economy. I I heard Moana Jackson speak um, several years ago, and everything he said seemed to me to be uh, phrased in terms of secret knowledge and of defending things and not letting people see them, which seem, doesn't seem to me what science is about. You know, science is about the sharing of knowledge, surely. What, do you have a perspective on that? Well, I, I think maybe Moana's comments were, were given in a context of, of many indigenous peoples around the world having becoming the researched and having their indigenous knowledge taken and repackaged and then patented and sold back to them. So there was a weariness. Um, but I think in today's, even in today's times, it's slightly more enlightened that we can begin to look back into that mātauranga. And of course, in your opening statement, you said they brought with them this traditional knowledge from the ministry. I would contend that mātauranga Māori is knowledge gained by a certain process. Very similar to science, and in fact, a lot of mataranga yeah, would be science. clearly experimental, you do what works. Exactly, and so mataranga is contemporary. Mataranga has been created today as we speak. Mm. And there's also, um, you, you know this as well as anyone, um, that there's a very hard-nosed, um, very prosaic reason to pursue this. The, the Burl report this year um, made it pretty clear that, uh, that if science and technology are not developed in the Maori sector, then that sector will go backwards. Yes, well, that's true. The Burl study uh, shows that uh, 
Maori are generating a lot of wealth for New in the New Zealand economy to the tune of 36 billion at the moment. And we know that over the next 50 years that uh, we can grow another $12.5 billion worth of value to the New Zealand economy. We are a self-sustaining culture already. Uh, we're producing our own leaders from science into all sorts of other areas. Um, and if we do nothing, then the Māori contribution to the New Zealand economy will decrease. Uh, the number of jobs for the Māori population will decrease. But if we introduce science and technology, then we can grow that another $12.5 um, billion over the next 50 years and create 150,000 new jobs. So science and technology and being Māori are going to be part of the same equation. So how do you go about that? Where's that development going to happen? Well, I think for the, the Māori businesses today, both the tribal ones and then the Māori businesses in the private sector, uh, need to get closer to the Māori scientists. Mm. We have that same gap that applies to the uh, New Zealand as a whole. And so it's the bringing together the Māori science, knowledge, the new mātauranga, putting it back into the commercial world, and then the commercial world developing the wherewithal to take it into international markets. Um, and that's going to be very difficult because it's difficult for New Zealand, it'll be extremely difficult for Māori to do so. Scientists on the marae, yeah. Sorry, and to add to that, um, I've, I've just recently started a new role within the university as research director at Ngā Pai o Te Maramatanga, which is one of the national centres of research excellence. And I think we have a key role there um, to engage with our communities across all levels to try and engage and really get this uptake in, in mātauranga as well as science. and then collectively they can create solutions that neither of those bodies of knowledge could get to in isolation. Well, best of luck. And thank you, Dan Hikaroa, Pauline Harris and Manuka Henare. Well, that's nearly all for our special, but first it's awards time. We asked the Science Media Centre and the readers of cyblogs.co.nz to compile us their list of the best and worst reported science stories of the year. Joseph Barbosa has the good news and the bad news. At number five, close-up interviews American quake predictor Jim Birkland. Well, I say interview, but it was really more of a long-distance bear hug. He brings up all this sort of pseudo-scientific stuff, uh, even drawing a link between the stranding of pilot whales in the South Island uh, and the subsequent earthquake on February the 22nd. None of this goes questioned by Mike Sainsbury, uh, completely fudged over, uh, and no real interrogation going on of this guy's claims. Coming in at number four is Lois Ken's story for the Sunday Star Times about the practice of gassing meat. Not a scientist quoted anywhere. Uh, no one with technical knowledge of how meat gassing works is talked to uh, in the story, which is a front page lead story in our biggest Sunday papers. Bungled reporting by Isaac Davidson for the New Zealand Herald brings us to third place. Now this was a story that looked at some research out of the uh, Auckland University based Liggins Institute uh, at fructose intake in pregnant women. Uh, and it suggested that women who eat too many apples or drink too much fruit juice while they're pregnant could harm their unborn child. Now this was not really what the research said, it was a serious case of misreporting. What the research was pointing to was fructose that's contained in processed foods. So we had pregnant women ringing up the Liggins Institute in tears, worried about this. Uh, it could have been sorted out uh, if the reporting process had been more robust. So that's why it's number three on the worst stories of the last year. At number two, an exercise in confusion. No, no, original no, shot. No. When I it strikes me, Mr Ring, that it is harder to predict the when they won't ones. happen. Uh, it was so badly laid out that it actually undermined the science and confused the public. Uh, so it could have been handled so much better. So a real lose-lose for science and for science journalism. And the very worst story of the year award goes to a 60 Minutes article about an unproven high-dose vitamin C treatment that apparently saved a man's life. Why does it get the gong? 60 Minutes doesn't talk to anyone with a scientific or medical background, so crucial questions go unanswered. A lot of people came out in the scientific community and criticised the report. It was subsequently followed up in, in other reports and done so much better. So uh, 60 Minutes really sort of let themselves down uh, with this story, uh, and the side bloggers really pummeled them for it. North and South leads us into the best of the best with a well-researched article about vaccination. 
uh, very accessible read and went to all party scientists and people who are uh, anti-vaxxers, people who do not want to vaccinate their children. It covered all the bases and presented a really good science-based article. That's why it's number five. At fourth place, a New Zealand Herald story about Auckland University Associate Professor Krista Freitas, who argues that climate change isn't man-made. A very well-researched article, a balanced article that went to all the main players in this case and looked at that issue of academic freedom and how far it extends to scientists who are teaching slightly fringe or alternative views in mainstream organisations like universities. The third best science story was this scoop written by Kieran Chugg of the Dominion Post about a discontinued ag research trial to create a super milk. It looked uh, very carefully at what cloning had been going on in New Zealand, took the audience through the science of cloning and why these aborted fetuses uh, and the death toll of the animals that were in the trials was too high and meant that this taxpayer-funded research was discontinued. A great scoop, uh, but also laid out the science very well. That's why it's number three. At second place is Campbell Live reporter Tristram Clayton's attempt to atone for the Ken Ring meltdown, and he does pretty well. Well-featured story, lots of scientists included, and really went through with a fine-tooth comb the claims of Ken Ring that the moon has a significant pull on the earth that can trigger sizable earthquakes. And if they'd done that first time round, we wouldn't have had all the controversy about Ken Ring. And the best reported science story is this listener article squaring the health benefits of vitamin D with the need to avoid skin cancer. This story did a very good job of wrapping up the entire debate around vitamin D and exposure to the sun, looked at all the established science, interviewed some of the best scientists in the country, it was given great exposure by the listener, front page story. It is a big public health issue. If we saw more journalism like this, I think that really got to the heart of some of these science related issues, we'd be doing really well. And this has been the Media 7 Science Special for 2011. Thanks again to Lord Robert Winston, Sir Peter Gluckman, Dr Mike Joy, Claire Browning, Dr Dan Hikaroa, Dr Pauline Harris, and most especially to Manuka Henry, who made it possible for us to be in this beautiful building. We trust you've learned a little, or even a lot. We'll be back next week with our regular programme. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>